Um, I, I, our, our subject today is open pedagogy, and it's an interesting conversation because I bet there are other people on this webinar who could lead this conversation as well or better than I could. So I, what I'm going to try to do is, is facilitate a discussion primarily, maybe share, share a few uh, points or ideas or, or things that might be interesting or provocative, um, but, but hopefully leave a lot of time for, for, here's the example that I think is cool, or I was thinking about this, how do you talk about that? Um, so, so the more you all sort of talk back and ask questions and add your own point of view, I think the better this experience is going to be for everybody. In terms of the agenda I thought about, I, I thought we'd start with a quick framing discussion just to talk about sort of what, what are we doing here and why is open pedagogy interesting. Uh, do a quick sort of what is it and what does it look like in practice. Uh, talk some about how to support it um, sort of both at the class level. If, if a faculty member wants to do it, what are they likely to be doing? And then how to support it at the program level. So if you're running an OER program, what does supporting the practice of open pedagogy uh, in the context of a class or otherwise look like. Um, and then I'm going to do my level best to leave some good time for this discussion about if this is interesting, what does that look like in terms of the work of an action plan? Because I think that's something we're all thinking about right now in particular. So um, I haven't heard anybody yelling or throwing things yet. I might not because I'm sharing my screen. Uh, Tanya, is anyone horrified or, or walked out in disgust? No, so far we are all here and ready to hear you. Oh, good. Work to do. Um, so then what I want to do is, as I say, start with a quick framing discussion. So I'm going to ask everybody uh, in here today to take a minute or two to think about this question. What was your favorite course as a student and what made it your favorite course? What when somebody says, what was the best class you ever took or who's the professor that meant the most to you? What made it your favorite? Um, so let's take a minute or two to think about that and, and then I'll ask a couple of brave souls to either share in the chat or to say out loud what that course was and what made it so exciting. So I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and take a minute. Uh, you take a minute to, to think and then I'll, I'll call us back if nobody has jumped in enthusiastically before then. Okay, pencils down. Man, there's, there's nothing harder than silence in the classroom, and that's doubly so in a Zoom call where you can't see people working. So um, I, I hope that was a good amount of time for people to think about this. Is anybody willing to share your favorite course and what made it your favorite course? Sure, I'd be happy to share. Awesome, um, thank you. My my favorite course in undergrad was our music history class. Um, and I think that really all uh, was due to the instructor that I had. Uh, she was super engaging. She was definitely an expert um, and was good at making the content uh, relevant and like, interesting. So um, I took, I think, three courses with her, all music history based, and they were all, for sure my favorite. Awesome. So, so, so authenticity, passion, that this, this person sort of bringing their whole self to the classroom and, and letting you do the same thing as well. Cool example, thank you. Is anybody else willing to share? I will. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, um, kind of going off the same thing. I took um, a geology course in undergrad, even though I was an English major, and the instructor was so passionate and interested in it, and he made it the most exciting class that I ended up taking mineralogy the following semester with him just because I wanted to learn more from him because he made what could have been a really dull class, <laughs> a really, really cool class. 
Thanks for sharing. That's an amazing, like if, if you're such a good professor that people are going, I'm going to take mineralogy, that's a, that's a really good professor. So again, sort of passion, authentic connection. Thank you for sharing. Maybe one more. And if there are any in the chat, Tanya, feel free to surface those as well. Um, I can share. Okay, thanks. Uh, so my favorite was an undergrad, undergrad class that I took on Roman culture. And I loved it so much because the prof professor was so passionate about it, but also because the students did most of the talking in the class. So it was very discussion-based. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Thank you for sharing. So, so again, um, instructor passion and student agency, right? A, a sense that we're both actually here with our whole selves, not just going through the motions. Um, is, is sort of a theme I heard from those. Thank you all for sharing those. I'm sure others have good ones as well. Um, and, and I asked that question at the beginning because I think it's always good to sort of center, like, what, what are we doing here? What's the goal? And, and that's the goal. But also because it says on the slide here, I, I think of open pedagogy as like a machine for building favorite courses. That is, as we say, like, why open pedagogy? What makes it interesting? And what are the qualities we're trying to build into that process? Quotes like this are, the, are what you're hoping to see come out of it. I felt like my work mattered. I saw myself reflected in the materials. The instructor was passionate and cared about my success and well-being. Um, like a great story, and I've never had a class like that before. And, and I want to suggest that, that in the same way that, that the OER conversation often tries to move from why OER instead of commercial materials to why commercial materials instead of OER, right? The baseline should be OER. With a with a rebuttable presumption that okay well in this case you can use commercial materials I I hope one day we will do a similar thing where we ask the question not I've never had a class like that before but why aren't all my classes like that right every class that can be should be my favorite course tell me and persuade me why not to use open pedagogy as opposed to putting the onus on why use open pedagogy in the first place so so I. I I'm not surprised to hear a lot of those sentences in the favorite courses that you mentioned. Uh, so let's get into the open pedagogy stuff a little bit more. The number one question I am asked when I talk about open pedagogy or mention that I'm doing this or that thing is, what is that? And again, I feel like there's an analogy to OER a, a few years back. What's an OER was a question we would answer a lot. And now we're kind of at a place where people go, oh, open educational resources. Those are those textbooks that are, maybe they're free and maybe you talk about the license or whatever. But this question, what is open pedagogy? is a really live question right now. And I think part of that is that it's, it's sort of newer or more emergent, forgive the term in some sense, but I think it's also squishier in a lot of ways and, and maybe in some important ways that are worth talking about. So if you get that question, what is open pedagogy? My go-to now is I just send them this video from Rajiv. Um, it's about a minute long and you can see the text in the bottom there, but it's, it's a very quick, succinct way of saying open pedagogy is an access oriented commitment to learner driven education. Then he sort of spells it out from there. But, but the quick and easy version of it is it's a commitment to a type of practice, to a way of doing things. And that is both clarifying and also still pretty squishy and uncertain. And if you go a step further to dig into the readings, if you say, if, if I want to understand open pedagogy, I just need to read the, the baseline works to understand it. Um, it remains pretty squishy. And I'll, I'll argue to you in a minute that that's good, that that's a, a benefit of open pedagogy, but it, I acknowledge that it can be frustrating for folks to say like, no, just tell me what it is. Give me a definition. Um, and in a sense, open pedagogy would say back, no, we're trying to move away from checking those three boxes. But I, I have linked here at the bottom a resource called the Open Pedagogy Notebook that you might have heard of. There's an essay in there that, that the title of which is What is Open Pedagogy? And it, again, declines to offer a clear definition at the beginning, but starts to talk in these terms. Participatory focusing on people rather than technologies, uh, creative, sharing ideas and contributing to the commons, all those terms that you see sort of around the wheel here, those are the terms that sort of pop up a lot when we talk about open pedagogy. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of follow that model and offer a few different lenses into open pedagogy before sort of starting to talk about a set of examples of open pedagogy. And, and the first lens I wanna offer for what is open pedagogy is it is, the fulfillment of open education. That, that open pedagogy in one sense is no more than the pedagogy that is enabled by open resources. So when we talk about an OER is this thing with 5R permissions, open pedagogy is saying, okay, why do those 5R permissions matter? What are the new ways of teaching and learning that are made possible because you can retain, revise, remix, redistribute, and reuse in different ways? So, 
So open pedagogy historically grows out of this idea of open enabled pedagogy. And when we talk about it with people, it's often useful to say, it's the stuff you can do with an OER. So that's sort of a first lens, open as open enabled, as something that can be done openly that might couldn't be done otherwise. If you're talking to an education person um, and you say something like constructivist pedagogy, you'll get a quick, oh yeah, I got it now. In fact, I have heard education folks, folks in our school of education say, open pedagogy is just kind of a, a fancified term for constructivist pedagogy. You didn't invent that. You're just reinventing the wheel in some sense. And I think there's more to it than that. But I think if, if you want to talk at a theoretical level in terms of the existing body of literature around how to do education, this idea of constructivist, of, of people constructing their own knowledge, um, both through doing something rather than being told something, and in terms of actually building or creating something is, is sort of at the heart of that. And so the two examples I have here are, are the idea of having students take their lived experiences, identify things they're passionate about, and instead of doing a research paper about it, create an op-ed about it that's published somewhere, right? Start with something that you're invested in, build in a way that that is meaningful for you and do something that has an output into the world. So that's one example. A second example here is uh, A.D. Carson uh, famously was the first person ever to wrap his PhD dissertation. Um, and, and that's a great example of saying, I want to take what I'm passionate about and communicate it in ways that are meaningful, not just to my promotion and tenure committee, but to broader communities, particularly the sort of communities that are often left out of the academic hierarchy, right? Let's stop using resources, teaching resources, communication channels that are elite, that are privileged, that are limited to a certain set of people and, and connect more broadly with the community. I think of those things as constructivist and I think of those as really nice examples of what open pedagogy looks like. This is sort of built into what I just said, but, but maybe expanded upon a little. I would say that open pedagogy is often about productive pedagogy. It's this is the sort of disposable assignment stuff that you might have heard about if you've talked about open pedagogy before. That, that the traditional model, somebody like David Wiley would say, of pedagogy is like, I know a thing and you don't. So I say that thing to you and then you say it back to me and I write a red letter on your paper and then you throw it away. And we've all done a lot of work that didn't make the world better in any real sense. And so open pedagogy is a rejection of, of what he calls the disposable assignment and a replacement of it with pedagogy that produces something that makes the world better in some sense. And the, the wiki editathons, we're gonna talk about the wiki edu platform in a minute, but the wiki editathons, the idea that I'm gonna take the labor that I'm doing that, that has felt at, at best like calisthenics as sort of meaningless running on a hamster wheel to, you know, to burn some fat or whatever and turn it into something where my labor is actually seen as value and creates value in the world. And, and editing Wikipedia is one sort of easy example of that. The commons are benefited. The world is, is more knowledgeable or more representative in this case because this is about sort of filling Wiki's enormous gender gap through this sort of labor. But this idea that, that our work as students and faculty shouldn't be for its own sake. It shouldn't just be sort of do a bunch of jumping jacks and then go home because you've got a sweat on, but instead it should make the world better in some sense. That's another piece of open pedagogy. The next lens I would suggest, um, and I think this is a particularly important one right now, using the term right now in a few different ways, is that open pedagogy is a tailored and flexible pedagogy, right? Um, it's, it's, it's a truism at this point point that the sort of idea of the quote typical college student is not meaningful anymore. The idea that that college should be built for uh, an 18 year old white guy who's from the upper middle class who's probably going to go on to law school or to be a dentist and that's what it is. That's wildly out of date but too many of our traditional pedagogies and textbooks are grounded in that assumption. Uh, and we've been thinking about that recently in the context of technology. Right? Of course, everybody has high speed internet. Of course, everybody has their own well functioning laptop. And, and we've seen in the last couple of months, that's not the case at all. Um, but those assumptions about who the learner is and what, what they need, what they bring and what they want to get out of it are all wildly out of date. And so open pedagogy as a way to attack that sort of uh, pedagogy of assumptions in that way is really critical. And, and in a particular sense, I think there's a strong lens of equity in open pedagogy, this idea that one size doesn't fit all is true for everybody, but there are certain groups who have been particularly disadvantaged in the traditional model of higher education. That again, it's written for people who look a lot like me a few years back, um, and people who don't, aren't just 
not being designed for. They're almost being designed against in a sense. It's, it's something that's built for one type of person and many people in society and in higher education are, are really disadvantaged by that. So building a pedagogy that's not just not one size fits all, but that acknowledges the systemic issues and problems that we're trying to address by building a more equitable, diverse, inclusive pedagogy in that sense. I'll sort of flip it with, with one more in two parts. Um, and this goes back to the first set of responses you all offered in terms of your favorite course. Open pedagogy, when it's done well, can be a really authentic pedagogy. And I think that's important for students in some of the ways that we've talked about, right? You're gonna have a better experience. It's gonna be your favorite class. Uh, it's not gonna make these assumptions about you. But I think that's really also important for faculty. And when, when an instructor asks me, why should I care about open pedagogy? the professor in the box idea is one that I point to a lot. I say like, you're an expert. We brought you into the university because you're really smart and you've worked really hard to understand this thing. And I want to support a pedagogy that acknowledges and values your expertise in the same way that it acknowledges and values students' expertise. So if all we're getting out of a class is the professor in a box model, I take these five quizzes that everybody uses and I answer the right answers and I'm done, why is the professor even there? And at this moment, we're having the conversation, why should I pay so much for that experience, right? The, the spate of lawsuits that we're seeing right now from students contesting the version of education that we're offering are, in a sense, pushing back on this idea of automated, digital, non inauthentic connections, that they're saying, what I want from higher education is that relationship, is to, to see that passion and respond to that passion and bring my own passion as well. So, so open pedagogy is important for the other reasons we've talked about that are very student facing. I think open pedagogy is also really important for the value proposition of higher education as a whole. And that's something when I'm talking to individual faculty and especially with administrators, something I talk about a lot. We have something special here. Let's not disguise that. Let's highlight that in a lot of different ways. And, and then I've, I've sort of alluded to this already, but, but we are in this weird betwixt and between moment in terms of, of what teaching and learning is in higher education and in K-12 as well. Um, BC Campus shared this graphic, it's openly licensed. It's a really nice one sheet if people ask why OER in this moment. These are some good answers that, that are talking about OER in particular. I like to think that this blank space in the bottom here is where the open pedagogy icon and text goes. And I think we can talk in that space about the things we've already mentioned, more authentic, more equitable, more meaningful, um, leads to outcomes that are going to be beneficial for students in sort of self-development and very concrete get a job kind of ways. Um, but, but in a moment when we're asking these questions about what is education for, what does it look like in different places, open pedagogy's ability to be adaptive and reactive in the ways that we've talked about and also sort of build connections in different ways. This is the best possible time to have those conversations. So that's a lot of me talking about open pedagogy, again, with those lenses, the sort of cool, high abstract stuff. Let's turn now to some specific examples because this is the question I get second most often. What is open pedagogy? Oh, it's a learner driven, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, okay, that's all nice. What does it actually look like? What are you talking about? when you talk about open pedagogy. So I wanna, I wanna mention a couple of examples, share a couple of examples, and then ask you all to share some examples as well. Um, I mentioned the open pedagogy notebook earlier, that that's literally a place that is designed to gather examples. So if somebody asks, what does it actually look like? The open pedagogy notebook is often the first place I send them to. Um, CUNY also released this building open infrastructure resource that talks a lot about open pedagogy in some different ways. And then Rebus has this guide to make an open, making open textbooks with students is a third place to go for a set of examples around what does it actually look like on the ground? What do you mean when you say, let's try open pedagogy? So as I say, I'll offer a couple and then I'll ask you all to offer some as well. Um, the first sort of set of examples and courses you see that, that are described as open pedagogy are grounded in this idea that we've discussed already of contributing to the commons in some way. And the platform you probably see most often is the Wiki EDU platform, right? The folks at Wiki have said, we have always been about community and volunteerism and, and these sets of values and openness as well, right? You can't contribute to um, Wikimedia without that open license. So why don't we find a way to connect that mission with the, the mission of teaching and learning? And so you've started to see a lot of courses, I've got some on my campus, you may have some on yours, where 
one of, if not all of the assignments are about replacing the disposable assignment with contributing to Wikipedia through the WikiEDU platform. Um, this is an example from Oklahoma of someone who was doing women in medicine on, in, on Wikipedia in particular. I like, th I like this example because it's one assignment in the context of a larger course. So you could imagine a whole semester, and I've worked with faculty members whose whole semester is like learning about Wikipedia and information literacy and criticality and learning the tool, and then they have like a big final summative assignment that is about making substantial updates to Wikipedia. This, and that's awesome. That's a good way to do it. This is another good way to do it, where the professor said, this is a no, quote, normal course, and we're just adding a little, a pinch of open pedagogy in there. And so this example is nice for faculty because you can say, if you're not ready to jump in with both feet, although I think you should, here's a way to, to try a little bit, to just taste a little bit off the plate and see how you like it. And, and this faculty member said, that's what I was comfortable doing. That's been really successful. I've been really excited about it. Um, maybe I'll try more going forward. So, so that model of saying some of the intellectual labor that students are doing instead of being a research paper or something else could be something that's written for a public audience in that context. And I'm happy to talk some more about the WikiEDU platform. Um, in my experience, they're, they're really, really supportive. They're, there's somebody who will do consultations with you. Uh, the WikiEDU dashboard is, is pretty straightforward and easy to use. So it's, it really is a well-scaffolded way to get into this idea of assignments that contribute to the commons. So that, that's one tool that you see a lot. A second tool that you often see when people are talking about open pedagogy is Hypothesis, um, this sort of web annotation tool. Um, and the way Hypothesis works uh, in, a, in a classroom or otherwise is it looks something like this. You take an existing resource. Uh, it could be a journal article. It could be a magazine article. It could be a blog post on the, online. It could be whatever. And you provide these annotations on the side. The one I've, I've shared here is the OER Starter Kit, which Amanda at Iowa State did, and it is awesome. And getting started in OER, it's a good resource to know about. Um, Amanda, in the Open Pedagogy section, has added a set of annotations pointing to examples of Open Pedagogy. So we're getting a little meta here. But the idea is you have a faculty member who wants their students to do readings and talk about them. One way to do that that's more open is to use the hypothesis tool to have those conversations uh, not necessarily face-to-face -face and not necessarily in Moodle or Sakai or Canvas or whatever your LMS of choice is, but instead on the open web. So the annotation happens faster and you can connect to different communities as well, right? These annotations are neat because anybody in the world can engage with them. Um, so, so again, there's that sense of contributing to the commons, of working in the open in the way that people can see. Um, but that's optional as well. So if, if a faculty member says, this is really sensitive stuff, I wanna use hypothesis and I don't want anybody else to see it, that's an option too. If a faculty member or student say, we're happy to share eventually, but let's do our first drafts in private. Let's make our mistakes privately and then share publicly after a point, that's an option as well. So that's a second tool that you see often. Uh, Wiki and hypothesis are probably the two most common tools, but I'm ex excited to hear other ones that you have. I also wanted to highlight a, a more commercial tool uh, for a couple of reasons. One, um, if you are talking to an 18-year-old starting college or a 45-year-old starting college, they might have heard of WikiEDU. They might have heard of Hypothesis, but they've almost certainly heard of YouTube. So going back to that sort of lived experience constructivist lens we had a minute ago, uh, open pedagogical practices that engage with commercial tools can be really powerful. Uh, they can be powerful because those tools are really neat, because they're meaningful in the lives of students, and because they give you the opportunity for criticality, right? The Wiki EDU assignment does that as well. Uh, the comments I see from students who participate in Wiki-based courses often talk as much about, I really understand Wikipedia in a different way. I understand the rigor that goes into to the sources, so I feel better in that sense, but I also see the blind spots and the limitations and the assumptions. So, so you get the understanding of whatever the course is quote about, but you also bring a critical lens to a tool that students may already be familiar with. And using a tool like YouTube is a really, really good way to do that as well. Um, I live in copyright land, so I, I often spend a lot of time talking about fair use and their weird notice and takedown and why is that other person monetizing my content? What's that about? Um, but there are hundreds, thousands of lenses you could bring to a tool like YouTube. The example I've, I've chosen to share here comes from my own institution just because Maria Gallardo Williams, uh, the professor here is one of, my, one of my great heroes in the OER movement. If you've looked at the um, OER champion module, Maria is the one I mentioned, so I wanted to call her back here. 
Um, very quickly, what, what's happened here is Maria originally designed a set of student-made videos for learning how to do experiments in a chemistry lab. So she had students make the videos, uh, record them, put them on YouTube, and that was really exciting, and she did good assessment, and the outcomes have been great. Again, I talk more about that in the other module. She's now moving that into the VR space. So you see this sort of iterative use of commercial technologies that, that we used YouTube, and that was an important piece. And now we're using uh, various commercial VR platforms as well, some of which are open source and some of which are not. Um, but, but this idea of engaging with not just the lived music that students listen to or political discussions they're interested in, but the actual substantive infrastructure of students lived experiences and channels of communication saying like we're going to use YouTube because it's something you might know and is meaningful for you but also because it gives you a new way to understand YouTube whether you're making and sharing chemistry videos or you're thinking about you know what political points of view are or are not permitted or upvoted or all that kind of jazz on YouTube there's a larger conversation to be had so those are three examples from me. I'd love to hear other examples from you all. When you've heard of open pedagogy, who's doing stuff that's cool, totally okay for that who to be you if you want to brag about an open pedagogy project that you're doing, um, or, or what, what are the, the cool things in the space that you'd like to, to highlight? Um, I can contribute a little there awesome. at Occidental College. We've been using uh, Scalar a lot uh, as a way of, of public pres presentation of student scholarship, essentially, and, and lots of collective um, authorship um, that then gets presented in that, in that, uh, particular platform and because of its kind of um, scholarly affordances as well, it, it really opens up a lot of uh, opportunities to, to talk about a lot of different information literacy skills and uh, dispositions as well. Cool, so for folks who don't know, can you say what Scalar is? Um, Scalar is a web authoring platform. Um, it's open source um, and it allows for a lot of uh, integration of multimedia um, assets. Um, I'll, I'll pop a little thing in the, um, in the chat that, that can kind of direct you to like the hub of, of several of our projects that we've published there. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, that, that's a really good tool. I'm, my hobby horse right now is the connection between digital scholarship and DH in particular and OER. And so I love that you brought that to the fore because I think there's a lot of really cool stuff that is happening and can be happening in that space. Thank you for sharing. Is one other brave soul willing to share an example? It can be yours or somebody else's. Hello. Hey. Hey. I, I feel like there's this uh, inverse law of the more people on a zoom session the longer it takes for anyone to feel comfortable speaking uh but i uh, kind of like the wikipedia one one english uh composition faculty that i'm working with is wanting to kind to you know really use student e essays as examples for future students <clears throat> and basically kind of build an evolving uh a textbook or not really even a textbook just like a collection of you know good student essays as well as bringing in uh either either open or just you know freely available uh articles and things like that so that's that's one kind of approach that i've uh seen happen in my local context i'm in east tennessee Cool, thank you for sharing. Are you using a particular tool, press books or something like that to bring those together or? A, a uh, we haven't got to that, <laughs> but but yeah, I, 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 maybe, although I kind of see it as a, when I think of press books, I think of more of almost like a monograph, even though I know you can keep updating it, but um, yeah, we haven't, I guess we haven't settled on the platform exactly, but. That, that's totally okay. In fact, I think yeah. that's great. I, I think 
uh, th there can be a tendency, certainly in myself, and I'm sure in others as well, to sort of start with the tool. And then you know, now that I've got the hammer, where's a nail I can hit, right? Yeah. Hypothesis. Well, what can I hypothesize? Um, so I, I love that you're starting with the practice and the philosophy and saying, now let's figure out what tool does the thing we've already decided we want to do as opposed to starting with the tools. I think that's a really uh, aces. I, I hadn't thought of it that way, but yeah, good. Thanks. And, and, and Will, there are some rich examples uh, in the chat. I don't know if you want to take time or you need to move on, but there's some cool examples in the chat. Please, are, are you willing to share them? Oh, sure. Sorry. Um, so from Mary, an environmental studies professor at her institution worked with one of her upper level classes to write supplemental chapters for an open textbook used in another one of her classes. And the students were super excited about it. Um, and then Hillary said there were student collect collected ethno ethnographies uh, has been an OER project in process. Lots of conversations about consent and anti colonialism, as well as copyright and authorship. Um, and then does Dawn, my, oh, go ahead, Will. No, I just, the, the copyright discussion always does my heart good. Go on. Yes, and then Dawn said that she works with a faculty who's had students uh, write their own test questions in the psych department. Awesome. Thank you for sharing all those. Yeah, the, the writing your own test questions, I mentioned uh, Rajiv Janyani earlier, that's one of his, something he, he advocates for a lot, is this idea that you learn more from designing a good question with reliable um, distractors, as he calls them, uh, than, than you do from just answering questions. So again, that's there's giving ownership there, there's um, learning in a different way there, there's a sense of contributing to the commons there, uh, and it's also a lot harder to cheat, right? One of, one of my many critiques of the sort of inclusive access textbook in a box model is if, if there's a set thing that everybody's using, it's easy to find the answers and share those around, but if students are building the questions, it's, it's harder to cheat. So, so when I get the, well, why, why can't we use Turnitin? I'm, we need to use proctoring software. Our students are all cheaters. There are a lot of conversations we have there, but, but the idea of like, let's give them agency. Let's find assessments that are more authentic is, is a really cool way to do that. So I'm, I appreciate you sharing those. And for everybody, if you're looking for models, I think we've done a nice job of stocking some in the chat and some in discussion as well. Um, so, so we're starting to see this sort of center of gravity of the ideas that we've talked about with many, many different iterations and versions in those examples that we've discussed. So thank you all for sharing. Um, it's, it's a cool space in that way. So that's what open pedagogy might look like to a student or a faculty member. What does open pedagogy look like to a library or a, a somebody administering a program in some sense? If you're spinning up or, or continuing to evolve an OER program, what does that support look like in your context? And again, I'm gonna sort of offer three examples and then ask for others as well. Uh, the first example, and, and there's a pretty clear spectrum that's gonna happen here, is sort of as a one-off. Open pedagogy is a new thing. I don't really know about it, so I wanna dip my toe in the water. I'm gonna do it as a single project. And the example I have here comes from the folks at eCampus Ontario. It's an example I really like and I use a lot. Um, the Great Ontario Business Textbook Sprint. So what, what has happened here is that a group of instructors and students got together and said, there's a really good business textbook out there, but it's written for an American audience. It's a little out of date and we don't agree with all of the examples and assumptions. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna bring a group of people together. Uh, we're gonna first Canadaize it, right? We're gonna take all the US dollars out and replace them with Canadian dollars and that sort of thing. We're gonna work together to build those supplemental resources, right? This doesn't have the test banks I want. This doesn't have the slide decks I want, et cetera. Um, and then we're gonna update it and localize it in a lot of different ways. And that model of saying, we're going to bring students and faculty together to take an existing open resource and make it better in a lot of different ways, better in that it's more up to date, better in that it's more local, better maybe than in that it's more representative of the communities that are actually using it, um, is really valuable in and of itself. It's also valuable because you get really good buy-in. Um, the people who have been through that process, it's hard for them to say, that's not a good resource, because like you, you built it. I, I hope it's good, because you built it. Um, so, so the idea of finding, uh, this might be a way into a particular department, our, so engineering for us is the one we're always trying to get into. Uh, going to the engineering department and say, we have this OER, we've talked to you about it, you said you weren't sure about it, so we want to we wanna build a class or a sprint or a gathering or whatever where we're going to make it great and give it all the bells and whistles that it needs to have. And there doesn't have to be any other open pedagogy, anything there. We're just going to try that. And you hope at the end you've got a resource that people need 
and like, but also an experience where people say, I really liked that. I, I'm, I found some new ideas. I, I feel real ownership in this now. I want to do this more. Let's talk about other versions of that. So sometimes that thin edge of the wedge is a really nice way into open pedagogy. And, and I've got an example of sort of altering a textbook, but your thin edge of the wedge could be a single designing test banks, or it could be a single wiki edit-a-thon, or it could be a single whatever it is. But, but, but this is the just try a little bit. See if you like it. If you don't, I won't bother you anymore. That's one way to sort of support open pedagogy. The second way to support open pedagogy is as part of programmatic work. So at my institution, we have um, an alt textbook project. We give mini grants and library liaison support to folks who are willing to do OER. Uh, when we first started, sometimes that conversation was like, just adopt this textbook or just write this, this exercise or build a web resource. Um, and eventually we've gotten to the point where we just said like we need to we need to have open pedagogy grants we need to say even if you're not saving a million dollars in your course even if it's only 14 people in a class that would never merit an award under a rubric that that prizes finance you know cost savings open pedagogy is valuable for all these other reasons and so we're going to build that into our programmatic work um, the example I have here is from Keene State College. I pulled this example from UT Austin, who's doing really good stuff in a lot of ways. Um, the example from Keene State is nice because the, the professor writes about it some and shares the way she did it. Uh, there's also this great blog post from a student talking about why it was really exciting and meaningful for her learning as well. And that was supported through a, a more standardized, like we run an OER program. And one of the ways you can engage with us, you can review a textbook for OTN, you can write a textbook using Pressbooks, or you can do this open pedagogy stuff. So instead of or in addition to the just try a little bit approach, there's the we have a regularized process for doing these things and open pedagogy support is one of those regularized processes. So that's a second example. The third example I wanna share is from my own institution. It's what I spent most of Wednesday doing is our first cohort meeting for what we're calling the open pedagogy incubator. And the pitch for the incubator and the pitch for their, their other great models like this as well is that it's not about creating a thing, right? Open pedagogy isn't about writing a book necessarily. And it's not even necessarily about teaching a particular class that the way to sort of seed and make open pedagogy successful is by building communities of practice. So what we're doing is we're bringing uh, six faculty members together. Um, they have an initial cohort meeting where they talk about their goals. They do a series of workshops where they learn about uh, tools like Wiki edu or hypothesis and then we also have sort of more philosophically grounded workshops This is why data privacy is important in the context of open pedagogy This is why equity is important in the context. So they do those they come back as a cohort uh, and have more conversations They've been using hypothesis to edit readings throughout this process some more workshops some more conversation And then at the end they commit to this really amorphous uh, set of quote open interventions and so what we said to them is what we really want to generate is the community in the conversation. We're not going to hold you to adopting a specific assignment or, or using an open textbook or that kind of thing. We want you to come and have this great conversation and we're going to trust that by the time you leave, you're going to be excited about this stuff. And, and we, you know, as we chose our applicants, we made sure to pick some people who were likely to be interested in that stuff. But, but this is not just a one-off, not just a, we gave you a grant for that, but like, let's all come together and, and talk and communicate in that way. At the bottom is a link from our presentation from OER 20. That's like a 20 minute video on the incubator if you really wanna get into that stuff. I'm also happy to answer questions, but I wanna offer that as sort of a third model for engaging at the program level with open pedagogy. Do folks wanna share others, either things that you've done or things that you've heard about that you wanna try? sort of thinking about how you might support open pedagogy from your seat in the library or as an OER uh, sort of program officer. And I know this is a, this is a bigger ask because this is, right, you, you may be coming to this workshop going, I, that's what I came for you to tell me. <laughs> like, I, I want to know how to do that. I, I didn't come with all the answers. That's totally okay. I, I want to give a moment. If anybody wants to share one, that's great. If not, it's totally okay. I hope these have been some good examples.
Cool. Well, I'll, I'll go on now and, and we can circle back to that if we need to. Um, so, so the last part of the, the sort of structured discussion before we get into the open con conversation is how does this align with my action plan, right? All of you are thinking about how do I build or expand upon or, or make a stronger um, OER program in the context of the SMART goals we've been talking about and of the action plan that you're developing over time. So, so I wanted to, to point to a few ways and then ask you all to talk about some of the ways that it might, as, as we've been talking over the last 40 minutes or so, um, ways that, that might have come to your mind or that we can sort of suss out through a conversation. So if somebody said, what is open pedagogy good for in the context of an action plan? Th these are some of the thoughts that came to my mind. The first is that as we talked about, open pedagogy embodies the values of OER, that there's a sense in which OER, right, Robin DeRosa has this famous quote, I, I don't want to be a member of a movement who is dedicated to replacing crappy expensive textbooks with crappy free textbooks. And so the response to Robin would be, great, open pedagogy is our way of not replicating a crappy system and just slapping an open license on it, right? Open education isn't inherently equitable. It isn't inherently better in very many ways. It's a, it's a window into that. It's an opportunity to do those things. And open pedagogy is our way of saying, I want my pedagogy to be more equitable. An open license gives me permission to do that. These practices are how I actually make it happen. So, so in that sense, it embodies the values that we often talk about in the context of open education in a, what feels to me like a really walk the walk way. So that, that's one thing open pedagogy might do is, is it's a way to say, we're gonna walk this walk in my action plan and in, in X, Y, or Z way. Um, it can also be the what now. So, so when you get your faculty champions and they maybe start with adopting a textbook or doing a slight remix or building something, many of them are gonna come back and say like, that was awesome, what, what next? Now what do we do? Uh, and it's nice to be able to say, well, if you like that first taste, here are another set of things you can do, right? That, that also sometimes happens at the institutional level. What now? We, we've run our program for a couple years and it's going okay. What next? So it can be a, a next step in some ways as well. A, a third way that I've seen open pedagogy be really valuable is when I talk to folks who are at schools that do not perceive their students as being in deep financial need. It's, it's a private institution. It's a small liberal arts. Um, that there is a perception among, among administrators and faculty that our kids are all rich. Textbook costs don't matter to them. And first you have to have the conversation, all your students aren't rich, a lot of your students are in fact pretty broke, and those students are at an even greater proportional disadvantage because so many of their peers are rich. Um, but, but if for whatever reason your institution doesn't understand cost as a significant issue, or maybe more frequently, if an individual instructor says like, ah, I don't care, that those kids can, can, you know, I paid for textbooks and they can too. When you get that professor, being able to talk about open pedagogy is, is a different way into a conversation about why open is interesting and important. Um, so, so that's a sort of a third way that open pedagogy might align with an action plan. If you, if you know or suspect that you're going to get those questions of like, okay, the cost argument didn't sway me. What else have you got? That's a what else you might have. Um, we've already talked about some ways that open pedagogy can make OER better and more sustainable. Right. This is open pedagogy can be the solution to the pretty good problem. Right. I looked around at the existing open educational resources and they were all fine, but they weren't quite right for me. Great. You know, you can remix them and make them better. Faculty will often go, how? What does that look like? This can be a way that that looks like, whether it's the sprint we talked about or the students write the, the test banks or whatever it is. Open pedagogy is a mechanism for doing that, that sort of remixing, making better stuff that we talk about in terms of open a lot. Again, something that's been on my mind a lot recently is that open pedagogy is a way to critically engage technology and surveillance capitalism. Our campus, like most campuses, is taking a real hard look at turnitin.com and at ProctorU or one of those proctoring services that if you dig into the terms of use on those are pretty creepy. Um, they get root access to your computer and they can watch you the whole time and there's a person staring at you. And, and anyway, I, I, I've got a whole soapbox I won't subject you to, but we are in a moment where we're getting a lot of too good to be true offers from inclusive access folks, but also from Turnitin and Proctor and all those other folks as well. And being able to say, this is a set of tools for more critically understanding the assumptions that go into those things, the specific rights that we're giving away when we do that, 
you know, what it means to take a short term, quote, free deal that locks us into two years at a high cost, etc. Right. Open pedagogy is a way of saying we exist in a world that's often mediated by technologies and we're not going to reject that world out of hand. We're going to critically engage and understand it, particularly in the context of surveillance capitalism. Um, I've found that to be really, really powerful and really, really exciting for myself and for a lot of uh, faculty and library folks I've talked to as well. So those are some of the ways this might engage with your action plan. Have other folks thought about, as we've been talking or earlier, as, as I'm thinking about this SMART goal or as I'm building my action plan, this is where open pedagogy might fit into that conversation. Has that, has that been something you've thought about or would that be something that's useful to discuss? Well, there was a question that was raised in the chat. Thank you. Um, yes. And it, sorry if it's more nuts and bolts than you wanted to go to, um, cool. but, I, but um, Tim is wondering if you could talk a little bit about how faculty assess student contributions in this open ped world. That's a really good question. Um, the answer is going to vary based on the type of open ped that you're using. Um, so Rajiv has shared his sort of method for having students create questions. That includes a rubric for assessment. This is what they're supposed to do. This is what a good one looks like. This is what a bad one looks like, et cetera. Uh, the Wiki EDU folks similarly have a set of tools that are available in their dashboard for doing that assessment. But a lot of the times the assessment is gonna be more organic um, to the assignment. So, so an example we didn't talk about, but one I like a lot, the anthology of earlier American literature is based on students using uh, public domain, so hooray, no copyright, um, but, but stuff you would put in a reader about earlier America, sort of 1600 to 1770 or whatever. Uh, and so their job is to go out and find something and add it and then sort of write about it and justify it, to situate it. So that it's building a textbook in a sense, um, but there are a specific set of reasons that you do that and ways you're supposed to do that. And, and there's some information in that approach about the way you think about assessment, but ultimately the assessment that happens is the same assessment that a faculty member would do when students were writing, you know, if they were just discussing an existing resource from the past. Well, it, is the composition clear? Are the arguments well made and coherent? Like, like all, all those boxes that you want to check or, or ways you would want to assess quote, you know, old approaches can be brought to bear as well. But I will say that because this is so individualized, um, the advantage of using an existing tool like Hypothesis or like Wiki is some of that work has been done for you already. Whereas if what you're doing is we're going to collaboratively create the syllabus with students, right? I'm going to give you the basic learning outcomes and we're going to work together to build the rest of the syllabus. There's some real labor that goes into designing the assessment piece and, and, and the other work as well. Um, and, and sort of in that vein, I'll share one of my favorite open pedagogy sayings that I've heard, um, which is that there, there's an old saw in the open community that open is free, but it's free like puppies, right? To, to create an open textbook, there's not a cost to it, but there's a lot of maintenance that goes into it. There, there's some after the fact buying of puppy food and that sort of thing that goes into it. And, and that's absolutely true. Open pedagogy is free the way free puppies are free. But the comparison that I like is that open pedagogy is actually more free like free dragon eggs are free. There will be labor and time and effort that goes into raising those little eggs into big dragons. But at the end, you get to have a dragon to ride around on. So there, there is labor and it would, it would be bad practice to disguise or pretend that labor isn't there. Everybody should go in with open eyes. But the pitch is the results are going to be worth it. You're going to get a better resource. You're going to get a more authentic learning experience. You're, this is going to be your student's favorite course that they're going to talk about for the rest of their lives. So come, we will support you in this labor. Let's do it together. And that's certainly true for assessment as well. So thank you for that really, really good question. Other, other general questions or, or things about the action plan you want to talk about? Well, this is Cheryl. Um, I'll just share that one of the things that we are pursuing at the University of Arizona is um, a zero textbook cost major. Um, and the 
units that are interested in doing it, we, we won't be able to do it purely with OER. So we're also looking at library licensed uh, ebooks, but also open pedagogy. And so we've just launched the Pressbooks platform and we'll be working with uh, different uh, colleges on campus and, de and departments to um, have students work on developing textbooks. That's awesome. How are, how are they going to do assessment? We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great answer. To that. that's, that's the start of every best answer in the world. So I'm glad that you said it. So thank you for sharing that, Cheryl. We, we have about 10 minutes left. So if, if you have heard everything you need to hear, I'm happy to, to we can all scatter to the wind. But if there was something you, you came in hoping to talk about or a question you came in hoping to have answered, this is definitely the time to ask that question. Hi, this is Rachel Fleming. Um, I just wanted to bring up at my institution, we have a real focus on um, high impact teaching practices and our Center for Teaching and Learning has some grants associated with that. So that's a real partnership opportunity um, for me to get together with that, the, the Center for Teaching and Learning and work together to promote open pedagogy with faculty. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. And that's a really good point that, that the flip side to that, there's going to be some labor is you're exactly right. This is a great place for partnership. We are our digital and distance education folks, Delta, um, are sort of similar to that. And, and they have been great partners on this work. The VR example that I shared that Maria Gallardo Williams did, Delta has been a really critical partner in the technology side of that. So, so maybe another thing for your action plan is if you're thinking, how do we build a partnership with X, Y, or Z? this can be a really good opportunity for that. So thank you so much for sharing. Well, um, this is Tanya. Uh, so yeah. I, was, I was at an institution once and uh, presenting the, the faculty workshop, the OTN workshop, um, mm -hmm. and covered you know, some examples of open PED and, and OER enabled PED and, and faculty were like leaning in and asking questions and we're so excited. And then someone um, kind of put a pin in it by saying, well, you know, you need to get student consent um, and kind of made it a scary thing. Um, and so, you know, as a librarian, can you or any of the librarians on the call speak to how might you approach that conversation or is there a template even in a way that's not scary and doesn't stop the conversation um, about, yes, I'm, I'm creating things with my students and yes, consent's involved and authorship's important, but it's doable. That's a really good question. And it's a different question for a 300 person class than it is for a 10 person class. Um, so a lot of the examples you see in OpenPED do tend to be sort of 10 people trying something out. Um, I think it's in inherent in the work of open pedagogy is building that relationship that's a two-way street with students. So I, I think good open pedagogy does that naturally. Um, and if professors are thinking that sounds awesome, except I don't really want to talk with students about agency, I, I worry about that, right? So, so I, I think it's not as daunting as they might imagine. I think if, if your students are going to be in for it, the, the student consent piece often won't be a huge hurdle. And if it's a huge hurdle, you have larger like if, if if your students don't want to do a wiki edu assignment it, it, that's going to be a really big problem so so maybe it's about being opportunistic um the, the mechanics of it are pretty straightforward you build your language into the syllabus and and we've got lots of good models for that um but but the the are students interested and on board piece that's a larger question about are your how receptive and interested are your students going to be in that um, and how much is it about, oh boy, I get to do this thing, I'm excited to do this, versus, ugh, I, I don't want to do that, right? And, and certainly there are students whose attitude is like, I'm trying to get an A and graduate. I don't want to learn anything, I don't want to build any relationships, I'm just trying to jump through this hoop. And that's a tough place to start your open pedagogy work. So if, if, if you think those are most of the students in your class, I'd, I'd have a hard decision discussion about how and when and if to do open pedagogy. I don't know if that's a good answer or not, but those are the ways I'd start thinking about it. No, that, it's a really helpful way to frame it. So thank you. Tanya, this is Cheryl. I've also heard um, concerns about open pedagogy in terms of student privacy. And uh, one example that gets thrown out is um, 
there's a, a student who's in hiding from an abuser and doesn't want their name to be on a public assignment. And so David Wiley, for example, when he developed a course textbook, he didn't list the individual students. He just said, you know, this is the course and he had the course prefix and number. Um, this is their class work. So that's, I think there are different ways to, to work around that, but that would be something to be aware of in conversations about um, open pedagogy on a campus. That's a great point. But, but, and that's something if, if there's an assignment to use Twitter, if there's an assignment like th that, that is a, a conversation that we should be having a lot with students. Um, I, I think listing them as the class is a way to do that. Um, certainly at our institution, and I think at most there's an obligation to offer the choice to use a, a pseudonym or similar to either just be listed as anonymous or to be listed at whatever suit as whatever pseudonym you choose. So I, I think that's that's something we should always offer to students, but particularly that's exactly right in the context of open pedagogy. That's the case. The, the other thing I'll say is that the wiki edu course I mentioned, we actually had to bring the counseling center in midway through the semester because students, those students were surprised by the, the way that wiki editors did or did not respond to their suggested edits. And so doing the doing the labor on our end of saying like, this is how to take critique and criticism. This is how to understand, you know, this process that turned out to be really important to us as well. So, so a lot of the labor of open pedagogy is thinking from the student's perspective, what's going to be surprising, what's going to be challenging, what dangers are we are we potentially subjecting them to, etc. So yeah, that's that's a really critical piece of the puzzle. And I, I appreciate you raising it. I think we've got time for one more question, or, or as I say, I'm, I'm happy to let folks dash a little early too, if that's the best use of our time. We've probably all been on Zoom a lot today. Well, there was one question from Hillary in the chat. Um, open pedagogy framed as universal design for learning is something I want to explore further. Does anyone have experience with this? That's a great question, and I have not had a lot of experience with that, but I'm happy to do some research. Has anybody else Dealt, sort of thought about that or dug into that much. And, and Hillary, if you're willing to share any any links or resources that you have bumped into it, that would be really useful as well. Um, I, I certainly Sorry, Sorry this, this is Hillary. I think um, just in the chat, Phil posted a really great link um, that talks a little bit about combining the two. Um, I work closely with our instructional design librarian as well as our Center for Teaching and Learning, um, which advocate for the universal design for learning and in assignment design, but they don't connect it to OER. And so I'm trying to find a way to make sure all of our resources are working in tangent um so that we can support each other because we're all kind of working towards that same goal and i think oer lends itself really nicely towards this idea of equity in a classroom but what i'm having a hard time with and what i'm seeing in my new oer projects as as our program really grows is that a lot of applicants are really wanting to use ar and vr which can pose problems for students who might not have access to those resources or have difficulties in terms of working with some of those technologies. And so I wanna make sure that there's an understanding of technology barriers, um, learning style barriers, um, and while some of those technologies can open doors, some of that can close doors as well. So I always wanna make sure that there's a framework and, and an understanding of this idea of um, an equitable learning environment. That's really rad. I, th I think that's a really important thing. Um, I, 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 that might be a great opportunity to write something that would really improve the community in a lot of ways. I, I think we've seen a lot of alignment with like information literacy and, and that, right, the ARL did the principles and everything. Um, but I, I haven't seen that written up anywhere. That might be my own ignorance, but, it, but if not, I think there's a clear need for that, that you're right, that absolutely aligns with all the things we're talking about. So, so whether that's you or you and, and 10 awesome collaborators or, or your institution or whatever, that, that seems like a really important need that, that you're right is not always being met the way it should be. Yeah, there was, there was hope that um, 
uh, myself and some collaborators would do an OER UDL toolkit, but unfortunately we did not get funded for that project. So maybe going forward, we would have more support. That makes sense. And, and funding cycles are always starting again <laughs> as somebody who's gotten yeses and nos. But yeah, thank you for sharing. That's, that's really great. We're, we're just about at time. Um, I'll, I'll close my screen now so we can actually or like, I guess y'all can see me the whole time, so I can see you all as well. Um, I appreciate y'all hanging out and having this discussion. Um, if there are things we didn't get to or questions that you had because I couldn't see the chat, I'm, I'll try to answer those offline. Uh, if you have other questions that occur, like tonight at midnight, you sit up and go, I need to know that. Uh, shoot me an email and I'll try to answer that as well. But I, it's an area I'm really passionate about and I really appreciate you taking the time to talk about it with me. Thanks so much, Will. Um, and if you could also, Will, share your um, your slide deck with me, um, PDF or however you want, because I have a feeling I'm going to get some requests for that separated yep. from the video. So yeah, absolutely, and and they're openly licensed. So so if you have to do a presentation, take the parts that are useful and throw the rest away. Awesome. This was this was great, and everyone, um, I'll be posting so the slide deck. I'll be posting the video as well as this extremely. I think this is the richest chat I've ever seen. So, Will, you're going to want to take a look at that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. And Tanya, can you save the chat? I think that goes away automatically unless it's saved. So you may already be doing that. I have saved it. Yes. Thank you. Thanks much. I'm excited to take a look.